All right. Good afternoon. Hope everyone's enjoying their lunch. We've got a rock star in the house that I'm about to introduce. So um, I'm really honored to introduce Dr. Howard Coe. Um, he is um, actually quite a superstar and an inspiration. So he served as the 14th um, Assistant Secretary of Health for the Department of Health and Human Services, nominated by then uh, President Barack Obama. And prior to that, he served as the Commissioner of the Department of Public Health for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He's a faculty at Harvard. I think the area that Howard um, really inspires me by is, um, despite his very diverse leadership um, profile, he has never forgotten to think about um, the impact of his work and leadership on Asian health. And he has been a huge proponent and advocate for all of us. So he is a friend, a mentor, um, uh, somebody who inspires me, someone that I grew up hearing about because my father knew their family and always talked about the Coe brothers. And so um, um, I, I uh, yeah, I heard a lot about you. Um, and I can see why. So it is an honor to introduce Howard Coe to come up to the podium. He's going to be speaking us today about health policy and health equity for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders. Howard? What a nice introduction, Karen. Thank you so much. And uh, what a pleasure it is to be back here on the farm. I was told to say that about Stanford, right? Um, I was here two and a half years ago with the first summit. And sitting here today and hearing the way the field has evolved and the data has come forward, and most important of all, the passion of everybody in the room has been most inspiring. So I'm just absolutely thrilled to be here and so honored to be giving this keynote presentation. Uh, let, me, let me start by thanking, of course, Dr. Ju Ha Huang and Dr. Rob Huang and all the members of the organizing committee. And I've met so many great colleagues uh, through these efforts. So uh, I am delighted to know all of you and look forward to meeting uh, the rest of you. And today, for this presentation, I'd like to take a little step back about how our discussions uh, to date today about gastric cancer are put into context with respect to AA and HPI health. And I must say, when I was listening to many of the presenters today, I was very moved because as a physician who's trained in multiple fields, my story is your story. Uh, I, decades ago, uh, when I started my journey as a physician, I wanted to be the best medical oncologist in the world. I wanted to cure every patient put before me and that was my passion and motivation back then, and I was very happy to care for patients for several decades and help many of them, I think. But too often I saw people who were dying too early and suffering too much from preventable causes, particularly around cancer. So at a very early stage of my life as a physician, I started thinking more broadly about prevention, early detection of disease, and then how it relates to policy, and then one thing led to another, and as you heard from Karen, I became first the Massachusetts Commissioner of Public Health through 9-11 and anthrax, by the way, and serving four governors, by the way, but more on that later, and then uh, becoming the Assistant Secretary for Health. They called me the ASH, because everything in D.C. is an acronym um, under President Obama. So with that background, let me give you a little backdrop here about health policy and health equity as it now stands for AA and HPI populations. So we're having this conference at a very interesting and fascinating moment in AA and HPI history in our country. On one hand, members of our community keep contributing to the social fabric of our society in very substantive ways. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I saw these skaters of AA and HPI background, winning medals in the Olympics earlier this year, winning medals at the World Figure Skating Championships, and being recognized and respected as American athletes. Uh, no description other than American athletes, that made me very, very proud. And if I can say I am a son of an immigrant family, my parents came from Korea a generation ago searching for the American dream. And so our Korean American minority status was something I, that we thought about literally every day, of course, and has led, up, led me to standing before you uh, today. So that's the good news. But of course, we're having this 
conference now, as the dean mentioned, two and a half years, almost three years into COVID. And I don't know about you, but as these hate incidents arose through COVID-19, uh, it, it was very disturbing for our community and for the country at large. Just uh, in May of this year, you remember that three women of Korean descent were wounded at an Asian-owned hair salon in Dallas. Um, and if I can say, the son of one of them, who is a young physician, reached out to me asking for advice and support. So that made, me, made it all very, very personal, even more personal to me, if I can say. Uh, we're very grateful to San Francisco State University and Professor Russell Jung, who put together this database uh, called Stop AAPI Hate, tracking hate incidents across the country, particularly around the AAPI community. Uh, most of these incidents are affecting AANHPI persons who are female. And we know there are hate incidents because the reports uh, include that the attacks were accompanied by cries of, quote, you brought the virus here, unquote, or the other one, which many of us have heard in our lifetimes, go back to where you came from. And when I hear that second quote, I often think, well, what happens if you came from the United States of America? So right now, the NHPI community nationwide is wrestling with the aftermath um, of this violence and racism through COVID-19. Uh, on the bottom here, I note a health affairs forefront that I had the pleasure of co-authoring with three great colleagues from Harvard, Mary Findling, Bob London, and uh, John Benson. And we put together some nationally representative polls looking at the impact of the COVID-19 experience on the AA and HPI community. Most report challenges with respect to mental health during times like this. Um, most report feeling unsafe in the public, particularly older people in the AA and HPI community. And this is the backdrop against which we are doing our work right now. So if I can say as a Korean American physician, I started thinking about issues affecting our community back when I was a pre-med student in college. And I remember particularly trying to write some term papers on Asian American health back then and, and finding absolutely nothing in the literature and absolutely no data. In fact, over the years, as I tried to get involved, I heard a constant phrase, Tialad, there is a lack of data. It had its own acronym, right? So, and of course, I, we've talked a lot about how race is classified, but back then I remember so many times it was black, white, other, and I don't know about you, but I got a little tired of always being in the other category. So. The two times I've been in public service have been an honor for many, many reasons, but I view that as an opportunity to really push the themes of health equity, health disparities, and particularly around the AA and HPI population and do what I could uh, in those times of public leadership. So that brought me to my time in the Obama administration from 2009 to 2014, an incredible honor for me. Uh, to serve under Secretary Kathleen Sebelius. This is when the, the last pandemic was going on, H1N1. So going through that for that opening year was a life-changing experience. Got me ready for COVID, if I can say. Serving under then President Obama, meeting the then Vice President, now President Biden, uh, meeting leaders like Senator Inouye from Hawaii. Uh, he was a historic senator from uh, Hawaii uh, until he passed away a number of years ago. And then on the bottom right is a picture that's well known in my household. In the fall of 2009, the president asked his top Asian American appointees to stand behind him in the White House as he signed uh, an executive order uh, revitalizing the White House initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So standing behind the president uh, with a blue tie is me, and standing to my immediate left is my brother, Harold Coe, he's wearing the pink tie. So needless to say, my mother likes this picture a lot. <laughs> so as the Assistant Secretary for Health, I was given many responsibilities that I absolutely uh, treasured and loved. One was to oversee the healthy people process. Many of you may know that this was started 
in, 19, uh, in the 1980s by former Surgeon General and Assistant Secretary for Health Julius Richmond. And then every 10 years, the ASH gets to announce the new Healthy People Goals for the country. So here in a picture I treasure, I'm standing with uh, Dr. David Satcher, who was the NASH and Surgeon General. Dr. Richmond, he passed away about a, a decade ago. And so the goals of healthy people for our country as it's getting more diverse, of course, one of the major goals is to eliminate health disparities. Uh, when I came in, uh, the secretary asked me to, to lead the HHS planning for an action plan to reduce racial and ethnic health disparities, especially since the ACA was signed into law in March of 2010. So we produced this report that came out in health affairs uh, then. And through it all, I tried to make sure that there was attention paid to, of course, all minority populations, but particularly AA and HPI populations. And so if you get to the current time, especially through COVID, one of the opportunities through the current challenges facing our community through COVID is that more people are paying attention to our community, which is often invisible and misunderstood. Uh, we are regularly still regularly treated as outsiders, as them rather than us, and as perpetual foreigners in our own country, if I can say. We're often confronted with the model minority myth, which is very challenging for too many. Uh, AA and HPI are underrepresented with respect to leadership positions in our society, in medicine and otherwise. So I had the great pleasure of writing about this in JAMA last year with two dear, dear colleagues, Juliet Choi and Jeff Caballero. I'll tell you more about them later. And then you've already seen uh, these slides uh, so many times now that the AANHPI community is the fastest growing minority group in our country. About 23 million expected to double by 2060. About six major subgroups have uh, populations over a million, Chinese American, Indian American, Filipino American, uh, Vietnamese, Korean, and Japanese. So the numbers keep growing and we have to pay more attention. And then as you've heard many, many times, uh, we are quite a heterogeneous community. And I, I love this graph, which I got from NPR, wonderful scientific journal, uh, that shows income, median household income on the y-axis and educational attainment on the x-axis and you can see that within the AA and HPI community, there's tremendous disparity with respect to educational attainment, attainment and income. So for example, over on the top right, the Indian American group uh, leads in terms of income and educational attainment. Tiny, ta Taiwanese Americans also do relatively well. But all the way on the other end, you see uh, often subpopulations from Pacific Islanders who are, who are not doing as well, and then everybody else uh, in between. So you've heard the, th the theme many, many times, but we have to recognize how heterogeneous our population is. And then, of course, there's, there's a very important Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander population, and this got uh, put on my radar screen when I made this visit as Assistant Secretary to Micronesia, and particularly to Chuk. Micronesia. Anybody here from the Pacific Islanders, uh, Islands, by the way? What a beautiful, beautiful place. Fascinating place. But the disparities are so, so striking. And it's all there in the midst of that beauty and, and the courage of the people there. So some of the pictures here are of me as Ash, as they called me, touring Micronesia with the U.S. ambassador to Micronesia. And one of the things we did one afternoon was walk around the island and visit the health clinics there. And when I say health clinics, that was usually a, a hut. And you walk in and here we're posing in the emergency department, which was a room with a bookcase with some medications in. That was the pharmacy. And then we're posing to these, uh, with these very brave health professionals who were staffing the place at the time. So it made you think a lot about health disparities um, globally within the NHPI population and within the AA NHPI community. So what do we need to do with all this? Uh, we are here talking about gastric cancer, but it's part of a bigger discussion to priori prioritize AA NHPI populations in the US health equity agenda. So how wonderful to see my friend Karen Kim again, because as she already mentioned, she and I and 
our great colleague, Dr. Holly Humphrey, co-authored this piece in Academic Medicine earlier this year, saying we got to be more uh, appreciative of the challenges facing AANHPI patients that we see, uh, assure more, more patient-centered care. I have a little picture of Dr. Winston Wong in there, and thank God I did because he's here somewhere. Um, <laughs> Uh, and he has been a wonderful leader for Asian Pacific uh, physicians. And in this piece, and also in our JAMA piece, I think the most important thing that I was proud to help message was that when you meet patients of AA and HPI background, or if you meet a person of AA and HPI background, don't assume. Avoid assumptions. Don't assume anything about the person's race, ethnicity, birthplace, first language, socioeconomic status, spouse or partner, sexual orientation, disability status or worldview. Don't assume, just ask and listen respectfully. I think all of us in the room who are part of the AANHPI community have been subjected to all kinds of assumptions. Listen to that story that Karen told about her mom, okay? That rang true for me. So if we can only do that, for the healthcare professionals, I think we've made some progress. And then uh, we've talked about the data challenges, but just to summarize quickly, uh, we are a population of over 50 ethnicities uh, with over 100 languages spoken, high foreign born numbers, 28% less than proficient in English, and data are often incomplete, misclassified, aggregated, or simply absent. I like to point out that often people think that with no data, there is an assumption that there's no problem and, the, and no disparity. And one of the most gratifying things about standing here today is to think about how over the decades, many of us have been at this, we are seeing more and more data. It's getting more and more disaggregated, more and more granular. The colleagues here in California are, are doing a tremendous job. I don't know if Dr. Lee is still here, but I really loved her presentation from USC and the California Cancer Registry. Um, and then a lot of this is now being applied to gastric cancer in, in very exciting ways, which I'm very, very proud of. Now, one part of the Affordable Care Act that I was really, really thrilled to see was Section 4302. That sounds like a wonky policy thing. Okay, no one knows what Section 4302 is. But this had to do with updating data standards for HHS-sponsored health surveys. So because of Section 4302, if you're taking a survey sponsored by HHS and you're reporting information about your race and ethnicity, because of the ACA, if you're a member of the AA and HPI community, you now have many more options to check that's in that red box there, okay? So no more black, white, other. If you're Asian American, you have seven subgroups to choose from, Asia, including Asian, Indian, Chinese, Filipino, Japanese, uh, Korean. If you're NHPI, you have four sub-options to choose from, okay? So I think this is really tremendous because we can finally get down to really understanding who we're trying to serve and the challenges facing that subpopulation. So that was an advance for public health in general and for health equity in particular that I was very, very proud of. And then as Ash, I had the incredible honor of visiting the N. Haynes trailers. Uh, colleagues have mentioned this morning the importance of N. Haynes, and I don't know if you know this, but this data is assessed by these trailers moving around the country and people coming through, being interviewed, going through standardized exams. Here I'm posing before this one area where they're taking a nutritional history from, peop from people saying, okay, what did you eat? Was it this much? Was, it, was the bowl this big? I mean, that was fascinating. You, you, you can have a mammography in the trailers. You can have bloods drawn. And so what I was thrilled to hear uh, when I was uh, Assistant Secretary was that in 2011, N. Haynes be began oversampling Asian Americans for the first time. So again, finally, data that's relevant to our community. Now, because of the Affordable Care Act signed into law March 23rd, 2010, uh, we now have 12 years later over 30 million people who have health insurance who didn't used to have it. And that has been another incredible historic chapter of the health of our country. Uh, as of today, we still have a dozen states that have not expanded Medicaid eligibility, but the progress is going forward. 
And as you well know, there have been multiple lawsuits to try to repeal and replace the ACA, but hopefully those have quieted down, maybe, we hope. Uh, we're hearing much less about those potential threats. So that is something that we're very proud of. None of that was easy, and by the way, if I can say as one who's been at this for a long time, if you want to do anything in public health in terms of progress, it is always much more difficult than you might think. And if you want to make it successful, you got to hang in there for a long time, for years, decades, maybe the rest of your life. And I tell my students that. So that's the tough news. The good news is you can't have a better mission than trying to improve health for all. So that's what we're trying to do here, especially for the AA and HPI population. Now, I remember when the ACA was passed, the uh, AA and HPI advocacy groups would come to HHS, and they'd always trot me out because I was the Assistant Secretary uh, of Korean American Background, and I would chat with the advocacy groups, can, can we reach AA and HPI populations to inc inc increase their health insurance coverage? And of course, this is a, a Herculean task, right? You need people of all different backgrounds, with all different language capacities. You need materials translated into multiple languages. You need advoca advocacy and outreach. And it'd be very er easy to say, oh, that's impossible. We can't reach these folks. They're, they're too hard to reach. But we did that, and I was so proud to support the advocates around the country. I particularly remember, I'm going to mention Jeff Caballero one more time. He was the head of APCHO and also Kathy Ko Chin, who was then the head of the Asian American and Pacific Islander Forum. And so all that happened. I had great memories of working with them. I respected their passion. And then I went back to Harvard, and I um, hired this wonderful uh, research assistant who was one of my students at Harvard, and I asked him to just review the literature on the, the impact of the Affordable Care Act on on health equity and health disparities, and he came back to me one day and said, Dr. Coe, no one's ever written or published in a definitive way whether Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders have gained insurance coverage from the ACA. And I said, what? What? So I, I forced him to go back. And again, you know, our population tends to get overlooked over and over again. So I said, okay, we're going to do this. So I am very proud to show a couple slides here where as you can see in gray is rates of uninsured for white, black, Hispanic, and NHPI before the ACA, and then in blue is the rate of uninsured after. And we can say, just by glancing at this, the insurance coverage increased for every minority, major minority group. So we're very, very proud of that. And then if you look at the AANHPI rates after a passage of the Affordable Care Act, the uninsured rate is about 9%, the, the white rate is about 8.8%. So in short, that disparity was essentially uh, closed. And so when we wrote this up in JAMA, no, in Health Affairs and JAMA Internal Medicine, we remarked how rare it is to say that we tackled in, in our society any sort of disparity and eliminated it. But the caveat is the follow-up ended only uh, in 2016, and we need to keep track of this to see if the disparity remains closed. We can't take any progress for granted. But that was very gratifying, and I give all the credit to the advocates who went out uh, doing all this incredible work. And then, of course, since we have talked so much about making sure that we're not generalizing for the whole population, we did this sub-analysis, uh, also published this in uh, Health Affairs, as I remember. And as you can see, for every major AA and HPI sub subgroup, the insurance coverage went up. Japanese, Asian American, Filipino, Chinese. For reasons I'm not sure I understand, Korean Americans had the highest rate of being uninsured. That's the bottom line. But that, that line has gone up. And by the way, someone's got to tell me why Korean Americans have the highest risk of gastric cancer. I still, still haven't heard that. Don't tell me it's the kimchi. Okay, please. <laughs> all right. So uh, now, why is all this important? Because one of the things that I'm very, very proud of, of the Affordable Care Act, is that there was a lot of emphasis on prevention. So as the ASH, who uh, cared so much about areas of early detection of cancer and tobacco control, uh, tobacco control has been a major passion for me, uh, if you didn't know. And by the way, 
to be spending decades in tobacco control and to be known as the ash was <laughs> always very ironic for me, but that's what they called me. But in 2010, uh, Secretary Sebelius and I co-authored co this little piece in New England Journal called Promoting Prevention Through the Affordable Care Act. And one of the major things we highlighted <clears throat> was that because of the ACA, uh, any intervention recommended by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force that had an A or B recommendation was required to be covered by uh, most health plans. So we're very, very proud of that. And Dr. Owens, who I just met and who's now my best friend, is going to be the next speaker talking about USPSTF. So we're waiting to see if the nominated gastric cancer topics regarding H. pylori and endoscopic screening will make some headway there. So good luck. The fact that you've even got to this stage in just a couple of years, I think, is really remarkable. So I congratulate you. But you just never know where this is going to go. So hang on. And uh, I'm, I'll be fascinated to see where this goes. I'm going to be fascinated to hear what Dr. Owens has to say about this whole process. And then other efforts that relate to this conference, which I'm very, very proud of. You already heard Congresswoman Chu talk about the emphasis on hepatitis. He talked, heard Dr. Kim talk about how this affected her mom. But this is another development that I'm very, very proud of, and it has to do with a very important National Academy of Medicine report on the top right that came out, I think, in 2009 or 2010, and the chair was Stanford professor Dr. Sam So, who's pictured on the bottom. So the report came out. It was great. It was fascinating. It documented that Hep B and Hep C are huge public health challenges in the world and our country, relatively overlooked and almost no attention from HHS. So I'll never forget when Sam came in and said, okay, here's our report. What are you guys at HHS going to do about it? Can we work together? Uh, when I was here a couple of years ago, Sam was here, and he's an absolutely irresistible guy, right? So I, I don't know. So he's, he's here somewhere watching, I'm sure. <laughs> but I huddled with my colleagues. Um, I particularly want to credit Dr. John Ward on the right, who was, head of the, who was then the head of the hepatitis division of CDC, Dr. Ron Valdaseri, who was a deputy um, assistant secretary for health, and my dear colleague Rosie Henson, my spe special advisor. So we huddled, we caucused, and then we agreed that we would bring HHS together to put together the first ever national viral hepatitis action plan. You see the major goals here. And I did this for multiple reasons. Most important of all was it needed attention as a public health challenge, but Hep B in particular was a major, was and is a major threat for our population and needed more attention. So I was very, very proud of that. And then the whole effort brought me in more and more over time. It was all really fascinating and very rewarding. We had federal initiatives on viral hepatitis. We had outreach to AANHPI communities. I got a kick out of this one. They put my face on a poster, take care of your liver. Then they also decided that my face should go on other Asian language posters, so here I am. I don't speak any of these languages, by the way. So it uh, just shows that you've got to use every part of your personality to promote public health. So what I'm proud to say is up through today, this plan, is, uh, this planning and these efforts still exist at HHS, although it's going into its second and third iteration. Uh, even this year, we saw that the ACIP Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommends a universal Hep B vaccination, so that's a step forward, and we're very, very proud of that. So that, that was very, very gratifying. And then uh, another thing that made me move closer to the GI community, by the way, if you don't know, I'm an honorary gastroenterologist, okay? <laughs> just, just can't resist this is uh, when I had the incredible honor, again, working with Rosie Henson, but with working with three presidents of the uh, ACG, the American College of Gastroenterology. By the way, I know so much about GI stuff, I know the difference between ACG and AGA, right? <laughs> so uh, David Greenwald, uh, former president, he's here, a uh, wonderful guy. Uh, Dr. Mark Pochapin, excellent leader. And I have to credit my lifelong friend, Dr. Ron Vender, for this, because uh, Ron is one of my closest friends on Earth. And uh, he and I have stayed in touch over many decades. And so one day, I was the ash, and Ron had become the new president of HCG, and we were on his porch. It was a beautiful summer afternoon, and uh, we were sharing a drink and just talking about life. And uh, over that little meeting, we said, hey, we should work together on something, not just as friends, but as 
leaders in our respective organizations. And from that, this 80 by 18 initiative was born, uh, sponsored by the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. Uh, Dr. Kim has presented some very impressive stories and uh, facts and figures about collaboration, but we ultimately had over 1,500 organizations committed to this goal of 80 by 18. We, we saw those rates uh, inching up over time. We didn't quite make that goal, that's, that's okay. And then the American Cancer Society took it over after 2018 to call it 80 in every community. So that was another bit of experience with respect to the importance of prevention and early detection in the world of uh, GI conditions. And so uh, when, you, when you put this all together, when Dr. Juha Huang called me, and Juha, I always kid you about, I mean, this, my coordinator said, there's some doctor from California who wants to talk to you on the phone, and, and, and um, mentioned his name. I said, gee, I don't know who, who he is. And <laughs> got on, and this incredibly persuasive voice comes at me <laughs> and says, says, Dr. Coe, you don't know me, but you, you gotta help us out on this thing, and you know, I, I got this idea. So of course, I was completely won over in, in one phone call, and here I am. Now, if I can say, Juha and I, and Rob and I, and everybody here has become wonderful, wonderful colleagues. And uh, you know, a lot of attention on hep B and liver cancer and on stomach cancer for all the reasons you heard. And we had that first summit right before COVID in 2020, uh, this uh, nice summary that came out. Uh, Rob and Juha were very nice enough to make me a co-author on this. But of course, you started something. So as I came back, I'm thinking, how, how have we done? And I've been sitting here today so impressed by the progress because all the dedication, all the science, all the investigation, the presentation before USPSTF, and most important of all, the strategy building to make this a national issue to address health disparities and health equity for the future. Now, we've all seen this uh, graph many, many times. Again, as a Korean American, I always look at that top line and wonder why that's happening. Maybe somebody can explain it to me. Uh, here is the uh, data from the piece that Rob published. So you, again, you see graphically the, the, the higher impact on many AA and HPI population, particularly Korean American and Japanese American. And so uh, we have disparities within our heterogeneous community. And then all this happened through COVID, right? So I don't know about you, uh, but since I left this campus two and a half years ago, I've been consumed by this, like all of you have been very, very involved in this as a uh, public health professional, um, but also wondering if we were tracking how COVID-19 is affecting the NAA and HPI community. <clears throat> For a long time, I saw very little data, almost no publications. And then uh, one day I saw this publication <coughs> and it turned out to be from yet another student who was sitting in my class. He, he came up and told me about it, and this is uh, Brandon Yan and uh, Dr. Tung Nguyen, who many of us know from UCSF. Uh, he and his group put together this very nice summary of uh, disproportionate deaths in AA and HPI community from COVID. So you can see some of the, the high points back then, excess all-cause mortality, higher case fatality rates, uh, higher rates of hospitalization. Now, lots of concerns about whether this data is accurate, whether it's underreported, same themes over and over again. But the good news is that we are tracking this, and I hope we can keep following this, especially since the discrimination themes are still front and center, unfortunately, for our community. Now, I, I mentioned the opening slide, the impact of all of this on mental health for youth and adults. One theme that you're gonna hear repeatedly, if you look at the adult part, is that for AA and HPI adults with mental health challenges like depression, uh, those patients are much less likely to seek mental health care than non-Hispanic whites. You can imagine why with respect to trust and language barriers and other issues. So th that's another challenge that we gotta face uh, here's another issue with respect to diabetes risk. Many of you may know that AA and HPI individuals uh, have a higher risk of diabetes by BMI status. It got to the point that the uh, American Diabetes Association and other groups put forward a screen at 23 campaign. The, the premise was that um, instead of looking at a cutoff of 25 at 23, 
We should be screening uh, AA and HPI patients for diabetes. Uh, Dr. Wong and then Capit and Capip is uh, promoting this as well. So here's another part of public health for our community that we need to pay attention to. And then uh, if I can say, here, here's the issue that's just over, overwhelming our world for far, far too long. And I, I actually started my journey in public health because of the issue of tobacco dependence, which if I can say is uh, Asian American has devastated members of my extended family, um, both on my mother's side and father's side. And I'm sure many of you feel the same. So tracking how this pandemic, the tobacco pandemic is affecting the globe, and now in the era of e-cigarettes and harm reduction and the tobacco industry moving into that area, this, this is very, very complicated. I actually have something on this coming out um, in a journal tomorrow, but next time you have me back, I'll say more about that because the embargo hasn't been listed, lifted yet. Okay, so what do we do about this? Uh, I am very proud that we do have national leadership through this White House initiative on AA NHPI. Started by Clinton, has been carried through every presidency. So President Biden assigned uh, in May of last year a so-called COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act because he was directly trying to address the uh, hate that was generated through COVID-19, trying to have better tracking systems and better funding. So you see in the signing ceremony behind him are uh, major leaders uh, like the vice president, who is of course of Asian American background. Standing right behind the president is Congresswoman Judy Chu, who's a very wonderful colleague and somebody I respect so much. Uh, above the president's shoulder on the left, uh, the woman in red is Congresswoman Grace Meng of New York. She now chairs the Hepatitis Caucus in the House. A wonderful person, Senator Hirano from from Hawaii, uh, seated is uh, Senator Duckworth from Illinois. And then Crystal Kai is the executive director uh, and she's, her office is based at HHS. So I've, I've had the pleasure of staying in touch with her. And then we need to build better national collaborations. We've mentioned a number of these groups. I mentioned uh, Juliet Choi from the Asian Pacific Islander American Health Forum. I've mentioned Jeff Caballero many times, Winston Wong, I'm embarrassing him now because I'm showing his picture so many times. Holly Humphrey and of course my wonderful colleague, Dr. Karen Kim. So I'm hoping that because of days like today, because of the experiences we're growing, because the increasing commitment to addressing health equity issues in our country, uh, we can now make progress on gastric cancer. And I think what, from what I'm seeing here, we're, it has really been so impressive to see the progress looking at it from a worldwide point of view, focusing on data, convening experts, hearing from advocates. The young woman who spoke this morning was so uh, moving. Gaining support of the US PSTF, I hope. I hope Dr. Owens is gonna say something positive in just a couple of minutes. Uh, collaborating with national groups, gaining support of congressional champions, and of course, uh, supporting research. And if we do that, I hope that we can all move closer to this wonderful, goal of the WHO to have all people enjoy the highest attainable standard of health. Thank you very, very much.